Hello, and welcome once again to our course here on uh, Athanasius, Augustine, and Aquinas. Uh, and in this module, what we're going to be doing is continuing uh, our work on St. Augustine, uh, building on what we went over in terms of his uh, life story and the confessions last time. Uh, and we're going to dive into now uh, really what is uh, one of the central questions uh, in Augustine's thought and work. Uh, which has had a huge impact on the church ever since, right? And that is thinking about how is it that salvation works, or how does salvation uh, happen? Uh, we've talked before about how one of the key things that uh, we need to keep in mind that's driving patristic thought, this, the thought of these different fathers we're looking at, is that um, they're always thinking about how it relates to our salvation, right? So Athanasius is teaching, for example, on uh, the Incarnation, uh, is really rooted in uh, the importance of salvation and how um, our understanding of salvation is shaped by our understanding of the Incarnation or the full divinity of the Son. Uh, and so when we come to Augustine, uh, this is also going to be true, right? That Augustine's thought on a whole host of issues is going to be driven by uh, his understanding of how salvation works. Uh, and it's really at the heart of uh, his struggles in the two biggest controversies that really shape his career uh, and shape uh, a great deal of his work as a, as a writer, as a theologian. Uh, so the one is his struggle with the Donatists or with Donatism, uh, which is a uh, fight that really consumed the church in North Africa um, for a long time, uh, including St. Augustine's lifetime. Um, and also his struggle with the Pelagians or with Pelagianism. Uh, which is a debate that uh, began during Augustine's life and, and work as a bishop uh, and occupies him up until uh, the end. He's in the middle of writing uh, a large work um, arguing against the thought of a prominent Pelagian when he died. Um, and Pelagianism continued to be uh, an issue after his death as well. So those two big controversies of Donatism and Pelagianism are both intimately connected with the understanding of how salvation works, which we often also refer to as soteriology, right? So soteriology is the study of um, how salvation works. And so that's what we're going to be focusing on uh, here in uh, this module. Now, again, to kind of connect this with what we've done before, right, to think about Augustine's teaching on um, how salvation works, Augustine's soteriology, um, we need to put it in with, within its context, right? So. Um, when Augustine comes to think and write about um, how salvation works, he's doing that uh, within his personal experience, his personal context, uh, and the history that we talked about last time of his struggles with sin uh, and his, his gradual conversion, and then finally um, his final conversion through this encounter with God's grace um, kind of reaches its high point at that, that encounter in the garden. Um, so that's in the, the background for all of the stuff that he's working on when it comes to how salvation works. And then we also have to put it in the context of the broader church of his day, right? So um, the 4th century church uh, and the early 5th century church in North Africa uh, is a church that has um, experienced drastic changes with the legalization of Christianity um, within some people's lifetimes uh, when Augustine is writing about these issues. Uh, they are dealing with the influx of, of many people into the church of varying degrees of commitment. Uh, they're dealing with the reaction of some of the, the older, more rigorous um, Christians uh, to this influx of people. Um, and in the midst of all of that, there is a schism in North Africa, um, the Donatist schism, that, that complicates all of that and makes it that much more difficult to deal with for Augustine as opposed to, say, um, Athanasius, who where Donatism is not as much of an issue um, for him. So we've got um, a whole host of, of problems and tensions uh, in the church in North Africa when Augustine is writing, and a lot of them are going to influence and shape his thinking about how it is that salvation works and how he responds to these two different uh, big controversies that really cover his entire uh, career. So uh, out of all of these things, out of these struggles, out of this background and context, Augustine formulates a way of uh, thinking about and talking about um, how salvation works um, that really shapes Western thinking um, from his day to our own. Right? And it's important to note here when I include that adjective of Western thinking, 
right? Because um, in the East, the way they think about uh, salvation tends to be different, right? So uh, in the Greek-speaking Eastern part of the empire, which ultimately develops into the Eastern Orthodox uh, church that we have here today, they tend to think more uh, about salvation in terms of sort of metaphysics, right? As we talked about with Athanasius, where uh, it's more about human nature and divine nature and how the incarnation uh, restores our nature. Um, again, not to say that the cross isn't present, not to say that there aren't ideas of sin and penalty or some of the things we're going to talk about in the West, but they tend to have that, that different approach, a, a focus on metaphysics, a focus on the process of divinization where uh, our nature becomes more divine. Um, that's the language that they tend to use, and it's not influenced or shaped by St. Augustine's thought, at least not in any sort of a direct way. Uh, in the West, there are different ways of thinking about how salvation works, and in general, they tend to be uh, less metaphysical uh, and more legal, more uh, in terms of debt and punishment and guilt and those sorts of things, and we're going to talk about that um, as we go along. Um, but to kind of sketch out uh, the full range of possibilities that Augustine is going to start working in, uh, we can pause for a moment and, and explain that. Um, and one of the things, again, here to note when we're talking about the Church Fathers is uh, a lot of these things aren't defined when these controversies happen. Um, a lot of heresies aren't a situation where somebody knows an established Church teaching and comes in and rejects it, although, of course, that certainly happens. Uh, but a lot of these, particularly the, the early Church heresies, these are situations where an issue comes up and is really debated um, vigorously for the first time, right? And that's what's going to happen uh, with these controversies that Augustine is dealing with, that there's not a defined church teaching uh, on many of these aspects of soteriology uh, when these fights break out. Um, now there are, of course, uh, existing schools of thought or ways that people have thought about how salvation works prior to Augustine, right? The church doesn't exist for 300 some years without anyone thinking about or writing about how salvation works. Um, so there are different ideas out there uh, in the background that Augustine can draw on or respond to uh, in his own work. Uh, and if you're interested in this, I would highly recommend uh, a work by Gustav Allen, um, which is called Christus Victor. Um, and it's really a, a classic text on early ways of thinking about how salvation works. Um, and so that's really where I'm drawing um, the, these key different schools of thought that I want to share with you here before we dive into Augustine's thinking. So uh, Alain's work is, is a good place to start if this is something you have an interest in pursuing further. Uh, but he really divides the, the pre-Augustinian thinking uh, into kind of three different groups, or the patristic thinking into three different schools or, or ways of thinking about salvation. Right, so the first is what he calls the classical model, right? And the classical model uh, is includes this idea of Christus Victor that the, his his main book is titled after, uh, right? So this is the idea that uh, in his death and resurrection, Christ is actually the victor that he conquers or vanquishes uh, sin, devil, uh, death, um, the the forces that oppose and enslave mankind are actually like literally defeated by Christ in his death and resurrection, right? And this is a way of thinking about salvation that certainly uh, we find in scripture, right? We have uh, Christ conquering death um, and all kinds of allusions to that idea running from, you know, Genesis, um, the Proto-Evangelium there in the very beginning of the Bible, all the way through obviously to the book of Revelation depicts this quite dramatically in places. And so this was a very common way that people thought about salvation was, was that Jesus, uh, literally defeats the devil um, many times in, in thinking about this it happens right with his death and descent into hell uh, on Holy Saturday and then his victory is expressed if you will in his resurrection on Easter Sunday and so that um, Christ literally removes humanity from Satan's power um, with that conquest with that defeat of Satan that happens with his death and resurrection uh, and so that was probably the most popular way of thinking about how salvation worked, uh, at least in the West, leading up to the time of Augustine. Uh, and Augustine will draw on components of that uh, in his own thinking about it. Um, together with that, there is the, um, the Latin model, right, which uh, 
Ellen discusses, and it really becomes uh, the dominant model after Augustine um, into the Middle Ages and beyond in the West, right? And this isn't thinks about sin and salvation in terms, in legal terms, right? So uh, if we think about the Romans, if you think about Latin, uh, classical Latin culture, uh, one of the things we immediately associate with Romans is the law, right? That the Romans are very uh, juridical people, that is, they're very focused on um, legal categories and having laws to cover all sorts of different um, aspects of life, uh, and they enforce them uh, relatively well uh, for their time period, right? So there's a, a very legalistic way of thinking about things, and this shapes the Roman or Latin way of thinking about salvation as well, right? The sin is seen as a uh, legal offense against God. Uh, this can also have a variation in terms of being uh, sort of uh, monetary almost in nature, right? That it's a debt um, so that we can owe God uh, a certain punishment or a certain debt in exchange for the wrongs that we have committed. Uh, and so then, of course, in this model, what happens is that Christ uh, takes on the punishment or Christ pays the debt. Uh, and that is how salvation works, is that we get credited for what Christ has accomplished uh, in terms of paying our debt or, or taking on our punishment for us. Uh, and that too, of course, is going to be an aspect of Augustine's thinking uh, as well. And then the last model uh, used for thinking about how salvation works is what um, is called the moral exemplary model, right? And so that means that um, the way that Christ saves us is primarily by offering an example of, of how human beings ought to live, right? That prior to Christ, we are sinful, we, we, we do what's wrong, we don't live right, we are in a not in a proper relationship with God because of these sins and behavior. Uh, and that what Jesus does is he shows us the perfect model of how to be um, human. And that to the extent that we follow his model, right, that is how we gain salvation. That is how we participate in what Jesus has done and are ultimately saved. Um, now for some people, as we'll talk about, this can become um, like the primary way of thinking about how salvation works is that it is very much dependent on uh, to what extent we model Christ. Um, for others, though, this is uh, an aspect of their thinking that is combined with some of these other models um, so that people will have varying degrees of emphasis on the moral exemplary role of Christ. Right? And so one of the things to keep in mind whenever we're talking about uh, patristic theology, but also just theology more broadly, is that when we divide a certain school of, uh, or a certain part of theology into different schools, um, that very rarely are these divisions kind of absolute and perfectly clear, right? That most patristic thinkers, most Latin patristic authors um, are going to have elements of more than one of these models in their work, right? And of course, this is reflected in the fact that in scripture, we can find all of these models uh, expressed and supported in different passages as well. So when people are actually uh, composing their works on how salvation happens, um, they're going to include aspects from these different schools of thought. But we can still usually, in many cases at least, um, identify sort of the driving model uh, behind a certain author's thinking. So, so those are the different kind of range of options for thinking about how salvation works that Augustine has to draw on. Uh, as he goes and tries to make sense of his own experience, tries to address his own particular context, the needs of the church in his day, uh, and then tries to square all of this with scripture and with the tradition that's been handed down to him uh, at that point. Uh, and all of this, when talking about salvation works, how salvation works, um, Augustine is really the central figure because he is, a, he is a major transition point in Western thinking about all of this, that after Augustine, everything is different and everything is sort of a response to Augustine. Uh, and Augustine draws on these things that have come before, but he uh, formulates really a new way of thinking about salvation that is at least a significant development, if not a significant change um, from what, what went before. Right? And scholars spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, why is it that Augustine does this? Why is it that um, we have this just shift in Western thinking? Um, why is it that Augustine makes this happen? What is it that prompts all of this? And there's all kinds of theories about this. Um, of course, given the vivid details we have about Augustine's personal life, um, it's hard not to speculate that his own 
uh, personal experiences and struggles with sin play a large role in this, and um, I have implied uh, more or less as much um, a number of times up to now, and I think there's truth to that, that Augustine's own experience does shape this. But it's also, I think, very important to recognize um, that for Augustine, the reading of Scripture, and particularly thinking very carefully about uh, a number of different passages in St. Paul, uh, really plays a pivotal role as well. Uh, and uh, early in Augustine's career, um, he writes a letter to Simplician, um, and Simplician uh, was a, a figure who had proposed to Augustine a number of questions about um, uh, a number of different issues, but a lot of focus on thinking about some key passages in St. Paul where he talks about sin and grace. Um, and Augustine really ruminates on these passages in Paul, uh, spends a lot of time thinking about them and trying to develop a coherent account of how salvation works that is true to what Paul writes in letters like Romans and Galatians. Um, and out of that, I think that plays a pivotal role in uh, how he develops his thinking on salvation. Um, so it's not just his own experience, it's not just uh, the social forces of his day. I think uh, we have to recognize that scripture, and particularly St. Paul, plays a pivotal role uh, in all of that as well. Now when Augustine ruminates on Paul, when he puts together uh, the systematic account of, of Paul's ideas into an explanation of soteriology, um, this has consequences, right? And as I think I mentioned uh, in some of our discussions of Athanasius, uh, and when we talked about Arius and how the Arian controversy started um, really in reaction to the teaching of Alexander of Alexandria, I, I told you something similar happens in, in the case of Augustine, and that brings us to the present point, right? That when we look at the Pelagian controversy, which is um, really the big defining heresy uh, in Western uh, patristic thinking. Uh, this too gets its start not from Pelagius's work. Um, Pelagius is initially responding to, in fact, the work of St. Augustine. Right? So when Augustine starts um, writing about uh, his explanation of how salvation works, rooted in Paul and all these other issues, um, that provokes a response from Pelagius. Uh, and that's what really starts uh, the controversy uh, unfolding and blowing up into this uh, huge debate that lingers to our own day. So again, a lot of times it's not the nominal figure uh, who starts it all. A lot of times it's a reaction to uh, what is ultimately, excuse me, the orthodox um, teaching, and that's the case here. Now, having brought up Pelagius, uh, I do need to step back a little bit uh, and give us a little more context again uh, before we go further into this fight between uh, Augustine and Pelagius because in addition to sort of the mechanics of how salvation works there is this is all tied up with the debate about um, uh, how Christians have to live in order to be truly Christian and uh, a debate about uh, the role of the sacraments in all of this which is also tied to uh, this argument about Christian purity uh, and what makes one truly Christian or truly part of the church or what makes for a a true and efficacious, valid sacrament, that all these things are being hotly contested uh, in North Africa in Augustine's day. Right, and so again, as we've talked about, um, there are all these uh, Christians, Christians in the church in this day, many of them fairly lax uh, in, in their moral behavior, some of them probably very nominal in their commitment to their faith. Uh, so what do we do about this, right? And not surprisingly, this stirs up a lot of controversy. Um, so there are a number of different movements um, in the church in this period uh, that are uh, responses to um, this laxity that is going on, right? So there's uh, a movement known as Novationism, uh, which really gets its start in um, Italy uh, a little earlier on. So this starts in the third century. Uh, and there's a fight there about uh, proper papal succession. Um, but the Novatians, uh, Novationists, um, amongst other things, are, are very rigorous, right? So they, are, they have a very strict uh, sense of uh, church discipline. And so they ultimately, um, sort of their defining characteristic is, is a denial of post-baptismal forgiveness for serious sins, 
right? So for the Novationists, um, if after your baptism you commit some very serious sin like adultery or apostasy or murder, um, there is no opportunity for forgiveness, right? That you have um, sullied and violated the grace and the salvation that you received and it is irreparably lost. Um, and so that uh, actually begins prior to the legalization of Christianity. Um, but you might imagine that seeing all of these lax Christians um, coming into the church, it is certainly not going to um, decrease uh, the convictions of people who are drawn to this way of thinking about the faith. Um, so that happens kind of prior to Augustine's time. Uh, when we get a little closer to Augustine himself, uh, and in particularly in North Africa during Augustine's time, uh, there is a very big fight going on there uh, called the Donatist controversy uh, or Donatism. Right? And this is a similar uh, schismatic group, a similar uh, heresy. Right? And so the Donatists, um, their controversy is really centered on um, a fight about what to do with um, Christians or people who are within the church who compromised during the times of persecution. Right, so we have this vision that in the early church, uh, the Roman soldiers break into the church meeting. Um, they say, hey, if you're a Christian, we're going to drag you down to the Colosseum and you're gonna be burned at the stake or thrown to the lions or whatever it might be. And then of course, all of the Christians say, no, I will not deny my faith. And they uh, bravely head off to uh, their eternal reward. Obviously that did happen but it didn't always happen, right? And there are, in fact, many cases where uh, when the Christians are confronted, um, they do burn the incense to the emperor, they do pray to the Roman gods, or, uh, and something that particularly um, got people's attention, uh, they would hand over to the Roman authorities the sacred texts, uh, the sacred vessels used for the sacraments. Uh, and so in Latin, uh, based on the Latin for handing over, these people are called, called traditores, uh, the people who handed over uh, the holy things, right? And obviously we get our idea of traitors um, from this as well. And so these people who had handed things over to the Romans during the persecution, uh, when Christianity becomes legal, um, many of them want to return to the church. And there are all kinds of uh, different views on how these people ought to be dealt with, right? And so. Um, a big fight breaks out in North Africa about what do we do with these people. Uh, and this is a very complicated sort of uh, debate about uh, how different Episcopal sees ought to be filled, and we don't need to get into all of the details surrounding this controversy. But really what it breaks down to in the end is a fight over um, whether or not having these kinds of people in the church, and specifically whether having uh, people who were part of this, who handed over or who are complicit with the people who handed things over during the persecution. Um, if those people are in your line of ordination, does that render the sacraments invalid? So if we've got a bad apple, say in our ordination ancestry, we have somebody who, who handed these things over during the persecution or has approved of that by letting these people back into the church. Um, does that render their ordination invalid and does that then in turn render all of the sacraments that they perform or that the sacraments performed by people they ordained, do all of those become invalid, right? And that's really what this fight uh, of the Donatists centers on. Uh, and when Augustine becomes a bishop in North Africa, um, at least in a number of the things I've looked at and read, um, the Donatists are actually in the majority, right? That there are more Donatist churches and Donatist Christians in North Africa in Augustine's time uh, than there are who are still within the Catholic Church. Uh, so this is a big um, fight. And again, uh, it's easy to look back and see how they're wrong given our view of the sacraments, which we'll get to in a minute. It's easy to look back and see these people as kind of heartless and rigorous um, and sort of these puritanical, pharisaical figures. Um, and that's not necessarily wrong to an extent. But I do think we also have to put ourselves in the mindset of people who have lived through persecutions, people whose parents and grandparents lived through and maybe died during uh, these persecutions. Uh, and so if you had a parent or a grandparent who had gone to their death rather than deny their faith, um, it could be remarkably difficult to see um, other people or even clergy who had compromised and who had handed over the sacred vessels to the Romans 
come back into the church and then uh, take up positions of authority or be sitting in the pew uh, next to you. That could be very difficult to accept, right? And again, not that they're right, but I do think we need to recognize that that uh, would be a very great challenge um, for many people. And in fact, it is, and it leads to a split in the church in North Africa. And so um, Augustine is going to uh, be working in an environment where this is uh, a very big issue uh, that has to be dealt with. Uh, and so you have the Novationists um, broadly, you have the Donatists particularly in North Africa. Now on the other side, um, you do have those who um, in this environment and in looking at these sort of extreme reactions calling for um, you can only be a Christian if you are really without sin. There can be no serious post-baptismal sin, and if so, you're out. Um, if you ever sinned in the past, uh, seriously, we're, we're not going to accept uh, your ordination or your sacraments as valid. So there's this very rigorous strain of thought uh, in the church at this time. And then, not surprisingly, there's, there are those who react against that, uh, right? So uh, perhaps the most well-known of these is Jovinianism, right? And Jovinianism... Uh, is a, a movement or a heresy that kind of goes to the opposite extreme, right? And it denies the value of um, a lot of uh, aesthetical practices. Uh, it would deny any particular value to celibacy. Um, and it would say that um, we don't need to take any sort of these um, really serious steps towards a rigorous Christian life. Uh, and would in fact, um, instead of saying that you have to live this very rigorous way to be a true Christian, um, the Jovinius, Jovinianists would argue that um, living these very rigorous ascetical lifestyles uh, is not only required or expected, it, it doesn't bring any extra merit whatsoever, right? So that um, a person who commits to a life of celibacy does not get any particular merit for doing that, right? So that's going to be something that uh, most people are going to react against as well. So the challenge, of course, uh, is to find a way to cut through all of this um, in a way that's not going to go um, to either extreme, and that's really what Augustine is aiming to do in his work uh, on all of these issues. So um, Pelagius is going to jump into this mix as well here as another option uh, that Augustine is going to have to respond to, but before we get to him, um, how does Augustine respond to Donatism? Because that is going to shape uh, I think to a large extent, how he responds to Pelagius as well. Well, when it comes to the Donatist, Augustine writes uh, a number of letters uh, and a number of treatises against the Donatist during the course of his career. And of course, he also does a lot of things uh, pastorally and in terms of uh, working with the Romans, working with community leaders there in North Africa over time to um, uh, bring as many of the Donatists back in the church as possible to limit the spread of Donatism. And ultimately, by the end of his life, um, Augustine has turned the tide, right? And Catholicism is back um, on the ascendant, and the Donatists are uh, declining in North Africa. Uh, but in terms of the theology, uh, this is a really important uh, point in uh, Western thinking about how the sacraments work, uh, and that the Donatist controversy, if anyone knows about it or talks about it in most cases today uh, is because it really gives um, birth to the way that we think about uh, the sacraments as Catholics. Right? So uh, what Augustine argues against the Donatists, right? remember the Donatists say that if you have a, an unworthy uh, minister of the sacraments that those sacraments are invalid. Uh, and in having an unworthy uh, person in your line of succession in terms of ordination is going to render all of the ordinations after that invalid as well. Um, so that's what the Donatists argue. Um, Augustine, to the contrary, argues that uh, the efficacy, the, 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 the power of the sacraments, whether or not they really make grace present, uh, doesn't depend on the worthiness of the minister or the celebrant, right? So the sacraments get their strength, they get their power from God who works through the sacrament, works through the minister, and can do that even if the minister himself is unworthy, right? And so Augustine argues for this quite um, vigorously, right? And this is where ultimately we get the foundation for the idea of ex opere operato, 
right? So that is the sacraments get their power, the grace is made present by the working of the work, um, which is kind of not the most elegant phrase when you put it into English, but it is by the, it is by the very performance of the sacrament that the grace is made present, right? So it's not um, made more or less powerful or more or less valid based on how holy the minister performing the sacrament is. Um, the sacrament works because the sacrament is performed. Now, of course, it still does require the, the proper elements for the sacrament to actually take place, right? You have to actually have the bread and the wine and an ordained uh, priest or bishop for uh, the Eucharist to truly um, happen, for the, for the sacrament to really uh, take place. But as long as all of the required elements are there, uh, and the sacrament is performed, uh, the grace is just there by virtue of the sacrament having been performed by the working of the work. Uh, and so in the case of baptism, if, if you have all the proper elements, if you have water, if you have baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, if you have someone there doing this, intending to do what the church intends to do, it happens. Whether or not the person performing the baptism uh, is the most horrible sinner on the face of the planet or not. Um, that's not what makes the sacrament happen. That's not what makes the grace present. It's the performance of the sacrament itself. All right, and this is um, often seen in contrast to the idea of uh, ex opere operantis, uh, by the work of the doer, or the, this is the way of talking about um, that the, 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 the strength comes from um, the worthiness or the person performing the action. Right, and obviously there are many things that, that do work that way, right? So that um, it can have an impact on different parts of our spiritual lives, um, how worthy the preferred person doing something is, um, but not in the case of the sacraments, right? And of course, again, it's also important, I'll leave most of this for Father Guy to talk about in the liturgy class a long time from now. Um, this is not, of course, to say that the sacraments Will, will overcome um, any obstacle we put in their way, right? That it is still possible for the person uh, being baptized or for the person receiving the Eucharist to set up impediments to that grace, right? The grace is there because the sacrament was performed, but of course it is still possible for us to block that, if you will, uh, by the different impediments, by the different obstacles we would put in the way of God working in our lives. But to kind of step back, Augustine's basic point is the grace, God makes the grace present there through the performance of the sacrament. Uh, and this is a, a crucial point that has become the basis for Western thinking about the sacraments um, ever since. Okay, so now how then does that tie into Pelagius, into thinking about how salvation works? Well, um, basically here's what I would propose, right? Not me, this is certainly uh, not original. It'd be a lot of people who argued along these lines, right? That um, this thinking about the way the sacraments work, right, and this emphasis on the fact that it is God who works in the sacraments, and very little is dependent on um, the nature, the cooperation, the holiness of uh, the minister, right? And the emphasis is really that it's God who does this in the sacraments, right? That that shapes as well Augustine's thinking about how God interacts with us more broadly and how salvation happens uh, more broadly. Right now, uh, in this period, right, they're going to see, I mean, this is long before uh, the Protestant argument about whether or not baptism uh, is necessary uh, for salvation or whether it's a sign of salvation after the fact. Um, in this period, right, baptism is seen as required for salvation. Um, now, of course, they already had the idea that if somebody were martyred uh, during the, the conversion process, during their catechumenate, before they're baptized, that that could be considered baptism by blood, and that, that therefore, the people in that situation could still uh, be saved and could ultimately enter into heaven. Um, but for the vast majority of cases, baptism is necessary for salvation, that you get that grace, that relationship with God through the sacrament of baptism. Right, and so Augustine has this idea that in baptism, and in all the sacraments, it is really God who is doing the work. Um, 
the human celebrant of the sacrament or minister of the sacrament uh, is just a conduit, right? And that idea um, is going to impact his overall thinking about how salvation works, right? You also have to combine this, these positions he's taken on the sacraments with his own personal experience, right? Where in the confessions you see how um, he feels completely dominated by um, his sinful desires um, through a significant part of his youth and uh, young adult life into middle ages, right? That he has struggled with um, these sinful desires, uh, this concupiscence, right? Is this inordinate desire for bodily pleasures, uh, amongst other things. And he feels himself powerless to resist it, right? He, he reaches the point intellectually where he knows he ought to change the way he's living. He knows he ought to be uh, chaste uh, and to focus on his relationship with God, but he's powerless to make that shift until he experiences this uh, divine intervention uh, that is able to finally break him out of the hold of sin and allow him to um, begin this new life as a committed Christian. So that experience, together with his thinking about how the sacraments work, and reflecting on uh, many passages in St. Paul's epistles uh, where he emphasizes grace, right? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not a works lest any man should boast, right? Classic uh, Baptist Bible memory verses, right? There are a lot of passages in Paul, particularly in Romans and Galatians, but also in other places where Paul emphasizes that it is God's grace that saves us, it's not our efforts, it's not our work. Um, everyone has sinned. Everyone is worthy of punishment. Um, but because God is gracious, uh, he is able to um, extend grace to us even when we're sinners and save us. Right. So Paul uh, gets thrown into this mix with Augustine's experience, with Augustine's understanding of the sacraments. And ultimately, Augustine starts writing this out. Right. So he begins... Um, formulating a way of thinking about how salvation works that he, he puts down into words and puts down into texts, right? And so, uh, basically, um, what Augustine teaches that is at least a development, if not a change in church teaching, uh, is, first of all, in terms of original sin, right? So original sin, the idea of the fall, goes all the way back to the biblical period, of course. But for Augustine, when he talks about original sin, um, it has a seriousness and a, a severity that you don't really see to the same degree prior to Augustine. Right? So when Augustine writes about original sin, um, he sees it as, as more or less completely corrupting human nature. Right? That the sin that we inherit, the sinful nature that we inherit from Adam via our parents is a nature that is incapable of of doing good, it is incapable of seeking God on its own, right? We are, are literally kind of spiritually dead in our sins. Um, we're incapable of doing good. Um, and we are also guilty, right? And this is a, a crucial development in Augustine's thinking, right? So he argues that, um, and this is sort of a, an Eastern use of this idea of human nature, right? So um, although he doesn't put it quite in, Athanasius' human nature, divine nature sort of terms, but he would say that all of humanity uh, is involved with, is present in Adam's rebellion against God, right? And so that all of humanity um, shares in the guilt of that original sin, right? And he roots this in uh, his reading of Romans 5.12, um, which talks about through one man sinners in the world and through sin death. Right, so death passes unto all men inasmuch as all have sinned. Right now, there's a lot of debate about the proper way to interpret that verse. Um, but Augustine takes it to mean that we all share in Adam's act, whether we see him as an expression of a common metaphysical human nature or whether we just look at it in legal terms as Adam is sort of the legal representative for all humanity and makes this choice. Either way, we all share in the guilt. We are all separated from God we are all essentially um, damned, um, being eternally separated from God unless something happens. And our nature has been corrupted by this, right? That we are incapable of doing good or seeking God because of this original sin that we have. 
Okay, so this is the situation. We have all of humanity damned, all of humanity incapable of doing good. What does God do, right? Well, God looks at this and obviously wants to do something about it. Right? And so the way that this works is that God is going to have to take the initiative. We can't do anything. So what God does is he, he picks people out of this mass of damned humanity, and he intervenes and he extends grace to them. So he sees this sinner, he feels compassion, he um, gives them uh, this gift of grace. Right? And so uh, now again, these people are spiritually dead, right? So it's kind of like if you watch the old uh, Looney Tunes cartoons, right? That where you got the the wily coyote and the road runner, right? And, and the wily coyote um, he's chasing the road runner, or something happens, right? And he goes off a cliff, and you know he falls down the cliff for like a ridiculously long, humorous amount of time, and then you get this poof when he hits the bottom finally. So we, we cut to the road to the coyote. He's completely smashed at the bottom of this cliff, and of course, usually for good measure, then a giant boulder kind of falls down and smashes him as well. Right, so in Augustine's conception, this is basically what human nature is on account of original sin. That, that's you. So if you're in that sort of situation, you aren't going to be doing much of anything, right? If God extends a saving hand to you, metaphorically, right, this grace is reached out to you, you can't even reach up and, and grab that hand and get pulled up, right? That God is going to have to like literally pick you up, right? So that when God extends his saving grace to us, it actually spiritually picks us up and, and revives us, right? So that this grace isn't just offered to us and we say, oh yeah, that would be nice, I'd like that. That God actually kind of works within us to accept this grace that he's extending to us. So, so he's reaching down on the one hand and he's kind of reaching behind us and propping us up and nodding our head yes at the same time, right? That we are being um, given grace and God is working within us to cause us to accept that grace, right? And that that is how salvation happens, right? And then of course that is ultimately um, brought about through baptism, right? So that in baptism, the, the change really happens, right? Where you get um, the sin, the sin is, is washed away, the guilt and separation from God is gone. But of course, even after um, baptism, that concupiscence remains. So we are we are now we are no longer spiritually dead, but we still have this um, inordinate desire, this sinful desire within us to do what is wrong. So given that, right, Augustine is going to say that God continues to work in us. He continues to give us grace and he continues to work within us to cause us to cooperate with that grace in order that we can continue to lead good Christian lives. Right, so in Augustine's way of thinking about how salvation works, um, it is a lot along the lines of his understanding of how the sacraments work. It's really God who does everything. Right? We, are, we are at most cooperating with God's grace but even our cooperation, Augustine is going to say, is prompted by God working within us. Now, um, this is a lot to make sense of, and for many of you it's going to seem very strange and foreign. For many of you it might sound like um, you're, 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 you're very um, uh, ardent and, and, and committed evangelical friends or Calvinist friends or family because this is an aspect of Augustine's thought that is really picked up and developed a great deal during the Reformation, particularly by Calvin and his followers. Uh, we'll get to that in another course. But a lot of us will find this a little tough to make sense of at first, um, and it will become clearer as we look at the readings and talk about it. Um, and for a lot of you, this is going to seem, once you kind of work through it and get what Augustine's really saying here, um, a lot of you will probably find this, given my experience with teaching this, um, difficult to accept or even kind of repugnant, right? That Augustine seems to have a really pessimistic view of human nature, and, and that's true. I think that's a fair assessment. He is very pessimistic about human nature. Um, now, I think, to be fair from the outset, it's important to look at this um, on, on the flip side, right? So Augustine would say not so much that he wants to be pessimistic about human nature, although he is. He would say what he wants to do is to give God the full credit for what God does in causing and bringing about our salvation, right? That, uh, again, this has 
resonance in St. Paul, right? That it's not um, through our works, not something that we can boast about, right? It is God who works in us to bring out our, our salvation about. And Augustine would say he's giving God uh, the full credit for what God does in salvation. And really all we ought to do is say thank you um, for what God has done. Now, uh, in addition to many modern people taking issue with this, people took issue with this in Augustine's day as well. And this finally brings us back to Pelagius, right? And I don't want to belabor this discussion of Pelagius because we've already um, taken a fair bit of time. But just to give you a, a starting point of the two readings you're going to look at, Pelagius is a British monk. Uh, he travels to Italy. He's teaching in Rome. Um, he was sort of a, a revival preacher, if you will. Um, trying to lead people to lead more serious Christian lives and to deal with the moral laxity of many of the Christians in that period, right? So initially, Augustine hears good things about him and seems to think positively about him. But when Pelagius hears this teaching of Augustine that he's that's starting to float around, he reacts to it very negatively, right? And he basically not only rejects what Augustine is teaching, but he teaches um, sort of the opposite, if you will. Right, so when Pelagius teaches, um, he's going to teach that there is no original sin or guilt, right? That we don't, we aren't guilty because of what Adam did, uh, and our nature is not corrupted by what Adam did. Consequently, um, he's going to say that when we have the baptism of infants, it doesn't involve any forgiveness of sins. It's just entry into the community. Whereas Augustine, in his thinking about baptism and the sacraments, one of the points he highlights is that um, we baptize infants because it really does something. Uh, and it really does include the forgiveness of sin that we have as part of being uh, joined to Adam in his fall. Uh, Pelagius is going to say um, that um, physical death that we experience is not a consequence of sin. Um, whereas Augustine is going to say um, that it very much it was. Um, for Augustine, right, remember grace is really this it's the driving force of every, right? That grace is um, this power extended by God and working within us um, by God's work um, that really drives our salvation, right? It really is doing most of the work. Pelagius, on the other hand, is going to say, yes, grace is necessary for salvation. There's too many biblical passages to avoid that. But when he thinks about what is grace, well, grace is just the natural abilities that God gives us, right? Our, our own free will, our own intellect, all of these things are our expressions of God's grace, right? So that we can be saved by grace, and at the same time, he could say we, we are more or less save ourselves because what we have by our nature is, is a gracious gift of God. And obviously, Augustine is going to uh, reject that. Um, and given this very positive view of human nature where we aren't corrupted by sin, we aren't guilty, um, we have these natural abilities that God has given us. Um, Agath Plagius is going to argue that we could, in fact, be sinless. Now, Plagius doesn't seem to have taught, really, that people were sinless or that this happened very often, uh, certainly. But he holds it out at least as a possibility, right? That it would be possible for somebody to avoid sin their entire life and not just Jesus and Mary, right, by special divine intervention. Um, that this is something that would be possible for people uh, more generally. Uh, and as a result, right, that any of the commands in the Bible uh, can be kept, right, and we could, in fact, keep all of them. Uh, Augustine, on the other hand, is going to say, um, without special grace from God, almost everything we do is going to be a sin. We certainly can't avoid sin altogether. And for Augustine, the commands given in Scripture are there primarily to make us aware of our own sinfulness and our need for God's grace. Um, so Pelagius is going to take up the kind of opposite position to Augustine on all of these issues. Uh, as you might imagine, this elicits uh, a fairly vigorous response from Augustine, right? So Augustine uh, is going to argue against Pelagius' ideas uh, quite passionately. All right, so the first thing I'll have you take an excerpt from and look at uh, is a work called Nature and Grace that Augustine wrote specifically in response to Pelagius's work. Um, so Pelagius wrote this work called Nature, uh, and Augustine takes it and kind of goes item by item, blow by blow, uh, and responds to and refutes um, what Pelagius writes there. Right, and so at this point, Augustine is still hoping he can convince Pelagius 
uh, of the error of his ways and that he will come over uh, and see the truth of Augustine's position. Uh, and we, I'll ask you to look at this. You can see uh, what he says there for him, yourselves. But his main point in this work is um, to emphasize the necessity of Christ's um, uh, sacrifice, particularly his sacrifice on the cross, right? And so uh, Augustine's main point to Pelagius is that if Pelagius is right, this positive view of human nature and how salvation and perfection would be possible by our own efforts, that would make ultimately the work of Christ on the cross superfluous, right? That it's unnecessary. We could be saved without it, right? And Augustine is going to argue, I think fairly persuasively, that that is kind of a blasphemous position, right? That we can't, in fact, argue that what Christ does on the cross is unnecessary uh, for our salvation. Um, and again, he's going to make a similar argument when it comes to um, baptism and infants, right? That everyone needs um, the saving grace of Christ made on the cross. Uh, this is why we even baptize infants, right? Who need uh, that connection with God's grace uh, in order to be saved. Um, now, obviously, that's not the end of the story. The fight with Pelagius and Pelagianism goes on much longer. Many people take up Pelagius' cause, um, accept his ideas, develop them, so that Pelagianism becomes much bigger than just this guy Pelagius and his immediate followers. Uh, and it extends for quite a long time. Uh, and there's way too much there for us to cover. Um, I do want, though, to just um, also have you look at another work that comes from later on in this controversy, um, where Augustine is dealing with other people who have some issues with what he's teaching. Right, so, um, there's something called the semi-Pelagian controversy, right? So this is, um, scholars think, debate about whether or not we should really use the term, that it's really not a movement. But suffice it to say, there are some people who react negatively to what Augustine's saying, who don't go so far as Pelagius to argue that people could be sinless, right? There are a lot of people, particularly monastics, who um, think that uh, Pelagius is wrong about those things, but at the same time that Augustine is too severe in limiting the role of human um, effort and cooperation in salvation, right? So a number of them write to Augustine asking for clarification, and Augustine tries um, to provide that and explain how on the one hand he can teach what he does about how salvation works, being driven entirely by grace, and on the other hand still affirming that we have free will and that we ought to um, work hard to lead holier lives like the monastics do. So trying to balance that is something that Augustine spends a lot of time on in the final years of his life. So I'm going to have you look at a work um, called Grace and Free Choice, where he makes um, his arguments on that front. Right? And basically what you're going to see him do there is to try to balance these two things, to insist that yes, we have free will, yes, we are called to cooperate with God's grace and to earn, earn merit as a result, but at the same time, he describes the work of grace in such a way that it seems to be in tension with the idea of having free will or real merit. So, um, that sets the stage. What I want you to do now is to take a look at these things for yourself and read what Augustine has to say, and then we can spend um, some good time talking about and trying to work through and make sense of all of this. Um, admittedly, it's gonna be strange for many of you probably, but this is a very important idea to understand both for the rest of Augustine's ideas that we're going to look at in the next um, few modules, but also more broadly, this is really um, definitive in shaping the Western way of thinking about how salvation works, particularly when we get to the Reformation, uh, that it's really important to understand Augustine in order to understand Luther, Calvin, uh, and all of those folks. So enjoy your Augustine, and I look forward to talking with you about it on Blackboard.